But what is fuzzy? So what do you want to do? We want to test the program to see if it beha behaves correctly. So how do we do it? We basically attack it with uh, inputs. And let's see a bit more um, a visual approach. Let's say you have a, um, a target program, right? We, in an infinite loop constantly, we generate inputs. For example, let's th think of the most basic approach. We generate random inputs, random blobs of bits. We send them as input to the target. Then we run the target. We monitor its output and see if this, mm, uh, the target behaved in any way uh, unexpected. For example, it crashed, it hanged, had memory leaks, um, any such th thing. And then when we find something interesting, we mark that input and we investigate it further. And this basically goes on and on and on in an infinite loop. And this, as you might expect, can take a large amount of time and resources. However, if you do it properly, it can have um, incredible effects in your um, security, overall security, because you can fastly determine and find bugs in an automated way. Now, um, before, usually programmers could use the excuse of compiling to slack off. Nowadays, fuzzing is just as good as an excuse. Because if you set up your fuzzing infrastructure properly, you can just spend a few hours, set it up, and then let it fuzz for as much as 24 hours to a week, for example, on a one specific target. It's a perfect excuse to slack off. Now, why is it important? Um, let's put it like this. Fixing a bug in production mm, can be a hundred more times, um, ten more times more expensive than doing the re development stage if you find it early on. Also, for example, in 2006, over 70% of the security vulnerabilities found by Microsoft that were patched were found using fuzzing. And also, Microsoft has something called the SDL, Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle, which is like the security bible of their development lifecycle. And uh, this bible actually mentions fuzzing as one of the mandatory stages of the life cycles. So it's quite built in in their security e ecosystem. Now, let's get to more interesting things. How it works. And let's start with the basics. So you might assume it's something like black magic. Well, let's clarify that it's not. Everybody will be able to understand the basics and more, some of uh, the more advanced features as well. First of all, let's try and categorize this. Uh, so, fuzzing can be categorized by the following. It can be generation-based versus mutation-based, um, depending on how it generates the inputs, the seeds it uses uh, to attack the, the target program. And generation-based basically means you generate the input seeds from scratch. Mutation-based means you use the previous ones and mutate them in a specific way to generate new ones in an infinite cycle. The second category can be white box, gray box, or black box. Now, what does this mean? A white box, most of you might assume, means you know everything about the target program. You have the source code, the binary, everything. That's the best scenario, usually not the real life one. On the other uh, spectrum, we have the black box approach, where you know nothing of it. Think of it as a simple a black box, an entity where you just give it input, you have no idea what happens inside it, and you can only monitor the output of it. And in the middle, we have gray box. You know something about it, but you don't have the source code. You're not sure how it works, but you can somehow, let's say, tap into its inner workings. And we'll uh, clarify that a bit more later. And now, the last um, category, can, it can be dumb versus smart. What does this mean? A dumb fuzzer basically means it takes, um, has no account of the structure of the input. It's, it's, it's not the way of the structure format, grammar, whatever you want to call it. So it basically just treats the input as a random blob of bits. It doesn't know, if, for example, if the fifth bit means something or the seventh bit something else. It's, it's just uh, random for it. On the other hand, a smart fuzzer knows to take into account the structure of the input seeds and can have um, quite a tremendous effect if it does that. Now let's discuss a bit about the state of the art. The current state of the art can be categorized as a mutation-based fuzzer, a gray box approach, and by gray box here, I mean also it's uh, co um, coverage-guided fuzzing. And we'll speak about that in a minute. And, uh, but on the other hand, it's quite dumb. And this fuzzer is called AFL, the American Fuzzy Lab. And I assume most of you are familiar or should be familiar with it. It's an open source fuzzer, the, the, the mo one of the most used fuzzers. It has tons of variations out there. So for example, if you're thinking of making your own variation of AFL, I encourage you to uh, look it up. Some, someone might have already done it. Um, this is like the CLI interface. Usually what you're interested in most is here, the runtime and upper right corner, the total paths it found, and the unique crashes or hangs. And the total paths, it actually refers to how much branching, how much it covered your program. And it, you, you measure this by paths. We'll get more into this in a minute. 
Now, why is AFL so successful? Well, it runs out of the box. You can just download it. It's easy to deploy and configure. Basically, it can be just a one click. It's extremely fast, and it's open source. I can't emphasize this enough. It's extremely fast. So you has to be fast in order to be successful, because otherwise you're just wasting precious resources. Now, the first rule of Fuzz Club must be fast. And I can't emphasize this enough. The second rule of Fuzz Club, it has to be fast. Otherwise, think of it like this. If your fuzzer takes, for example, minutes to just one iteration, in order to actually find significant crashes or behaviors, you usually do thousands, if not tens of thousands, or even millions of iterations. If it's not fast enough, you're just wasting years of uh, comput computation time. Now, the current trophy case, can, it's quite um, amazing for AFL. It has hundreds of bugs already found. High value targets as well, including OpenSSL, OpenSSH, FFmpeg. The full list can be found here on the official website, so I'll leave that to you guys. Now, let's learn from our current mistakes. So one of the most um, um, interesting and impactful uh, vulnerabilities in recent history is the hard bleed. So most of you might have heard of it, a vulnerability in OpenSSL uh, based on a, um, on a buffer overflow where you can actually read from the memory of, of uh, all the servers that were running that version of it. And actually, there's an interesting blog post about it that actually said, without knowing any inner workings of OpenSSL, if someone would have spent a few hours to actually set the fuzzing infrastructure, you could have found the bug with AFL in less than 24 hours. So a huge impact. Now, let's try to understand how it is so fast and how it works. So it's coverage-guided fuzzing. It uses lightweight instrumentation. And this is what I mean by the, the, um, the gray box approach. You don't, you don't necessarily have the source code. If it, you have it, obviously it helps. But you can just have the binary. And you can insert lightweight instrumentation onto the branching of the code. So imagine each time you have um, an if, and your code branches on a different executions. On each of these branching uh, points, it inserts lightweight instrumentation. And it can determine if it, if it takes a new path or not. And basically, when, an, when it generates an input that takes a new path, that's marked as interesting. And it uses it for future iterations as well to determine more and more paths. And basically, you want to cover the whole space of the program and find interesting behaviors, such as crashes, memory leaks, and whatnot. And, you, and basically, you guide the inputs using this coverage uh, guided fuzzing. Now, that's, that's the, the, let's say, the main secret to success. success. Now, um, the coverage measurements can actually be uh, summarized in three simple lines of code that actually insert in the branch points. We won't get into this. You can read more about it later if you want. But basically, the whole magic of how it tracks are these three simple lines. Now, let's look a bit of the, uh, the architecture of AFL. So as you can see, you have the initial seed corpus. You, can, you give it, for example, just one input file if you want. The more, the better. It's actually an art as well to give it a correct um, seed corpus. Then you have a set of mutation operators. So basically, for example, the simplest ones, you can think of them as random bit flips. Then it feeds this at the target binary over which it adds the instrumentation. Then based on this instrumentation, it gets code coverage feedback. And it evaluates it in a fitness function. For example, the fitness function here can be number of paths. If it triggers more code coverage, the better. And as well as uh, the most interesting ones are, of course, the one that generate crashes or hangs or stuff like that. And then the interesting ones are added back into the seed corpus, and it goes on and on and on in an infinite loop until you're satisfied with it. For example, the most uh, long, longest fuzzing campaign I've conducted was one week for a few uh, high-value targets, and it had quite a few C high in uh, interesting CVs. Now, another reason uh, for the success of AFL and why it is so fast, it uses a fork server. So uh, let's put it like this. If you have a very complex program, you spend usually a lot of time in, for example, initialization steps. And what you can do to speed it up, and AFL helps you do it, you actually, um, at the first iteration, you uh, pass the point when you've done all of the initialization, so you don't do it at the future steps. And then you for always fork from that point. You basically do like a, like a save point, like in a game. And then you always fork from that point. So you don't do the initial initialization all the time. And it can speed up quite considerably by a factor of 10 times for certain programs. Now, what's one of the main shortcomings of AFL and what it, what it cannot do? And this is a direct quote from the creator of AFL. 
And it goes something like this. So one of the most significant limitations of AFL files is that its mutation engine is syntax blind and optimized for compact data formats. And basically, in the end, it's never easy to get from something like set cookie foobar equal to set content uh, length minus one just by randomly flipping bits. That's, that's pretty much, it's theoretically possible with given an infinite amount of time, but it's not practically feasible if it's um, unaware of its input structure. Now, it, that, uh, the, he had a nice idea to actually try and cheat a bit. They introduced something called dictionaries. So dictionaries are like a file of um, um, magic words and sequence of bytes and that you can actually, uh, you, you know in advance and you can say to the files, oh, how about you use these uh, magic words and add them in your input seeds and it can actually um, helps a lot for simpler parsers but it, it can't handle very complex stuff. But it's a nice attempt, it actually does uh, improve things. Now, how do we overcome these limitations? Um, me and um, uh, a few colleagues worked on something, a uh, paper called Smart Gray Box Fuzzing. The paper can be found here in its entirety, and also we have an open source, fully implemented um, version called AFL Smart, which I encourage you to try. So, what's new, and how do we overcome this limitation of structure awareness? We introduced three new things. The first thing is called virtual structure, um, smart mutation operators, and a validity-based power scheduler. And now let's talk a bit about each of them. Um, sorry, first the AFL Smart architecture. So, um, besides the, um, architect the initial architecture of AFL, which can be resembled here, we also add the, um, the structure awareness part here, which we basically collect the structure and its validity, and we also introduce it in the fitness loop and feedback loop. Now, the virtual structure. So, basically, think of it as a as a as a tree, and we define the virtual structure with X XML files. So, each uh, as opposed to AFL, where you just provide the input seeds in the target program. Now, you have to provide um, an XML file which uh, defines the structure, the grammar of your fuzzing target, if you will. As you can see, this can be quite verbose. And basically, the, m the more detailed you go and do it, the more time you spend doing this um, initial um, de um, structure for the targeted program, the better the results you may have. And, and you, can, you can specify at bit level if you want. And here is an example of the wave uh, uh, format where you can see the chunk level, if you, if you have the, the, the main chunk ID, the chunk format, and the chunk data. Um, now, we also introduce smart mutation operators. So, uh, normally, AFL operates at the uh, byte level. Now we, we operate at chunk level, meaning that we, we also keep validity, uh, we also take validity into account when operating. So we have smart addition, smart addition, and smart splicing. Uh, on top of all the operations in AFL normally does, we also add these operations to chunk level in order to maintain validity. So think about, about it like this. For example, for the smart addition, we can take two, uh, C, uh, two previous seeds where we identify chunk C1 and C2. And basically, for example, we can just take chunk C2 and insert it into the new seed while maintaining its validity. So this way, we insert a whole new chunk, but it's still valid from the point of the grammar. And, and it won't be rejected at the initial parsing phases, an issue that's commonly known with AFL. Smart deletion as well, we uh, identify a chunk of a certain type and we delete it in its entirety. And then the most interesting one, smart splicing, where um, given to two seeds, we identify two chunks of the same type and then we swap them. Now, uh, last but not least, we introduced a validity-based power scheduler. So how does this work? Basically, we assign more energy, more time to the fuzzer on the seeds that, are, that have a higher validity than the others. However, until now, validity was um, considered something to be binary. It's either valid or not. We think of validity as something that's, that's percentage-wise. So it can be 10%, 20%, 60% valid based on how much of the file the, the parser can actually handle. This is what the, the, um, the part of the schedule does. Basically, if it's um, uh, more than 50% valid, but less than the total, we double it. Otherwise, we use the old ones. Now, a potential overhead could be when we uh, actually try and parse 
and create a virtual structure for each input. See, that actually can take seconds as opposed to milliseconds or less when you try and um, do it without virtual structure. So we introduced overhead there. However, we have a, a quite an interesting fix called deferred cracking. Wait, what does that mean? So by cracking, we refer to the um, process of taking a seed and creating the virtual structure, cracking the virtual structure out of it. And what we basically do is we notice without the virtual structure how much time it takes to find a new path. And if the, if the new paths are quite um, often, we're thinking, okay, it's not yet worth it to spend the time and crack the virtual structure. However, once the new path starts to um, slow down, we think, okay, it's starting to reach its limit. Let's kick in the deferred cracking and actually do the virtual structure because it's worth it now and see if we can get additional paths out of that target. Basically, think of it like a, the, an, a car with a turbo. After a certain speed, you kick it in. Now, what results we have with this tool? We have more than 42 zero days and 22 CVs and counting, which is quite nice, I would say. And here's, for example, um, a, lift of, a list of uh, the CVs we had with FFmpeg. We quite, quite had a few success with this, um, including free high severity targets which could actually, at the point when we found this, you could use them to do a lot of denial of service across the internet. As well, let's take a more concrete case study. We have this graph. Uh, the axes are missing, however, on the x-axis, you can imagine it's time, and on the y-axis, it's the number of paths. So these dotted lines are actually AFL, and, and, and it's a variation called AFL fast, and you can see it starts to asymptotically reach its limit around 2,000 paths after a few hours, however, AFL Smart keeps going almost linearly with time and finds more paths without actually uh, giving any sign that it will reach its limit anytime soon. So that's the power of input stru uh, the, of structure awareness. Now, if you go and try AFL Smart, there are a few hidden secrets. So I'm not sure. Let's just for fun. How many of you have actually used AFL? Okay. How many of you actually read the code of AFL? So if you look into the code of AFL, like let's say many games, it has a few, let's say, Easter eggs. And by that I mean it has a few secret um, commands and knobs you can use that are not documented anywhere except if you, reach, if you read the source code. And the same goes for our, um, uh, for our tool. You have something, we also implemented the NSG2 algorithm that actually uh, tries to do a Pareto front implementation for multi-objectives. So this is one of the more of the um, researchy approaches to it, so it's not actually um, officially released. However, the code and the functionality, it's in the code. And if you'd want to try and play with it, you can use it. So this is something like, for example, you want to m specify multiple objectives for each seed, and this tries to find the best fronts and try to go for that specific set of objectives instead of having just one objective, that being number of paths or crashes, it tries to optimize them. So for example, a new objective you could have would be uh, execution time or uh, size of the input. You can add these as secondary objectives and this tries to find the best ones. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you and try AFL Smart yourself. Okay, so best questions gets coffee. Aveți aici un microfon? Puteți să-mi vorbiți și în română sau vrei să fie online în engleză? Orice vreți. Ok. Hello, Alexandru. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would like for starters to make an addition. The last thing that he mentioned is very important and it's uh, actively used. You can use that um, heuristic in order to target specific pieces of code. And Google is using it in its fuzzing projects. For example, if you make a patch in a specific line of code, you can use that heuristic presented earlier in order to target and see if that uh, commit caused any issues. And it's a very interesting thing that you can actually go, mm, not try to improve the coverage, but uh, target that specific uh, piece of code to see if it causes any issues. And it's actively used. Um, the first question is, would be, um, uh, can we extend um, AFL Smart to work with a uh, grammar that is not uh, uh, defined by XML. Maybe it's written in some scripting language like Python or Ruby. But at the mm, okay, at the end of the day, you have to use XML because we use um, in the back end something called pitch, pitch bits, with, which are basically defined using XML format. However, y even Python or 
any language you want can be defined in XML if you have the patience to do it. So it, that's just a tool. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't limit you in any way. It's just more, let's say, tedious for certain approaches. Thank you. Alta Trabori? I have two coffees at least. Come on. <laughs> Um, is there any way to pause and resume fuzzing? So let's say, I don't know, you realize that you need to give it more time or something else that interrupts you, can you resume it? Uh, yeah, actually the way you can resume it is quite easy, so to speak. So in that infinite loop when I said that, that it creates more and more input seeds, um, if you think about the classic uh, genetic algorithm, the older um, generations of the seeds might get deleted and you only keep the best fit uh, latest generation, right? However, AFL as well as AFL Smart, they keep all of the seeds generated in a, in, a in, a, in a folder somewhere. And basically, if you have that, you can just resume it and give that as the initial input and it just, just start from there. All right, thank you. Come on, guys, you can do it. One more question. Uh, hello, uh, can you uh, customize uh, AFL Smart to talk to uh, web servers? Actually, that's a really good question, and you'll definitely win one of these. <laughs> so, um, when we finished AFL Smart, uh, the next step would have been to go for AFL Net, which is actually an extension of AFL Smart for network protocols. So, yeah, we, ha we have a POC for that. However, um, my master's ended that I didn't continue uh, on that path, but I think someone else has, and actually I'll get in touch with them and see what's the progress of that. But yeah, we had a POC for that. Good question. Thank you. Um, um, following up on my colleague question, there are uh, actual of work or, or for AFL which allows you to do this kind of operation. You can play the role of the client and send forged and uh, um, um, this kind of packets uh, to the client and uh, the other way around. There's also a, a project started by Google. It's called HongFuzz, which allows you to do network fuzzing. And it, they are very similar. And you can try to look them up if you really want to. However, I'm not sure if those take into account the response from the server and have a state machine with all the responses oh, as well. They will, uh, because they create a socket locally, and they c can still employ the, all the coverage and uh, all, the, all that logic. So it's just sending a packet that is specifically forged to increase the coverage. It's the same thing, just it's sent by a socket. So, so apparently, yeah, there is something. <laughs> 